Um, this is so exciting seeing everyone here, um, but we are going to get started with our main program. Um, so thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Joy. I'm the public program supervisor here at the Japanese American National Museum. Um, and I am here to do the fun beginning logistical notes. Um, for those of you that haven't already gotten food and drinks, please help yourself on the back table. Um, and if you need to take a step outside, um, get some air, um, you're welcome to head out to the outdoor area as well. We do have some heat lamps out there. Restrooms are located um, in the hallway behind me. Um, you can go out this door or the one on the other side. Um, and uh, as per the new LA mandate, um, masks are encouraged but not required indoors. Um, and so with that, um, this program's gonna run for about an hour or so. Um, we're really excited to have you all here. And also, if you haven't yet purchased your book and your copy of Rise, you can head straight over to our Janum bookstore um, in the lobby and they can help you out there. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic along to our Chief Operating Officer of Janum, Rick Noguchi. Hi, everybody. I want to welcome uh, everyone to the Japanese American National Museum. We have not had a large gathering of people at the museum since we temporarily closed for COVID in March 2020. So that was two years ago. But look at us today, right? We have an amazing, it's great to see so many friends and friendly faces here today. So we have two triumphs uh, to celebrate tonight. First, a triumph of humanity as we emerge out of the pandemic while staying safe uh, and healthy. We are so delighted to embrace once again a gathering of probably 250 people tonight. We had about 500 RSVP, so it's great to see this crowd. And secondly, the triumph of the API community as we soar tonight to celebrate the progress that APIs have made to pop culture with the launch of this important and groundbreaking book rise of pop history of Asian America from the 90s to now. And it is especially important that we celebrate rise in this unfortunate environment with so much anti-Asian hate. Rise will give us the additional lift we need, the increased visibility as APIs to combat so much violence against the API community. But before I go any further, um, I want to recognize a few people from Janum's leadership. Uh, first, uh, our trustee, Michael Okabayashi, in the back over here. And also, uh, Governor Tamlin Tamita, who is also included in RISE. Back over there. And I also want to give a land acknowledgment because Janum does acknowledge its presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Tongva people, who experienced brutal discrimination by European settlers and colonizers. We pay our respects and give gratitude to the Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of this land that Janum resides on. The Tongva people continue to care for and maintain connections to their ancestral homeland. And our mission of promoting understanding and appreciation of America's ethnic and cultural diversity cannot be authentically fulfilled unless we begin to recognize that truth. So a little bit about the Japanese American National Museum. We were founded in 1985 by Nisei vets and business people to tell the Japanese American story as an American story from our own perspective. We opened to the public in 1992 in our historic building across the plaza on the same weekend as the Los Angeles uprisings, which underscored our mission and shaped our direction for social justice. 
So we are celebrating our 30th anniversary of opening to the public this year. And by the way, the historic building is, uh, we consider that our largest artifact because it was built in 1925 as one of the first Buddhist temples on the West Coast. And our plaza is a site of conscience because many individuals stored some of their belongings in the temple before reporting around the corner to be taken away to assembly centers. So we opened this pavilion that you're sitting in in 1999 and then established the National Center for the Preservation of Democracy at the back of the historic building in 2005. And that was designed to explore issues of democracy, including race and identity. So we are pleased to be the site to help launch RISE, a pop history of Asian America from the 90s to now by Jeff Yang, Phil Yu, and Philip Wang. So this book helps define us and our impact on the world. So although the museum's galleries are currently closed, I want to invite all of you to come back to visit and see our core exhibit called Common Ground, the Heart of Community, which covers 130 plus years of Japanese in America. We also just opened last weekend a new exhibit called Sutra and Bible, Faith and the Japanese American World War II Incarceration, which explores the Japanese American community's spiritual journey to survive behind barbed wire. And in light of Women's History Month, we have Mine Okubo's masterpiece, The Art of Citizen 13660, which celebrates the 75th anniversary of the publication of Okubo's groundbreaking graphic memoir, which was the first book-length account inside an American concentration camp from a former uh, incarceree. And it's important for us to recognize the work as a masterpiece because it has been too long overlooked by the Western-based canon, which historically has not equitably reviewed women artists of color. Therefore, we, as our own authority, ident identify it as a masterpiece. So I want to acknowledge uh, some sponsors tonight, Sanzo and Panda Express, for their sponsorship uh, for providing the lovely food and drink. Thank you. I also want to express deep gratitude to HarperCollins for their collaboration and the publication of the book tonight. And I also want to thank Jeff, Phil, and Philip for launching at the Japanese American National Museum. And finally, I want to um, ask our partners from Gold House and the Coalition of Asian Pacific Entertainment, who have been critical in this launch, to say a few remarks. But first, um, I also just want to remind everybody that if you have not picked up your copy of the book, our museum store is open, so you can run over there and still have time to get it signed. So now uh, I want to introduce Jeremy Tran, the executive director of Gold House, followed by Michelle Sugihara, who is the executive director of CAPE, who will then kick off the program. Thank you. Hi, everyone. You guys excited? All right, come on, any more energy than that? Come on. There we go. Awesome. Uh, I'm Jeremy, uh, executive director of Gold House. We are a collective of change makers focused on advancing the representation, the unity, and the success of the API community. 
Um, we're really excited to be here. I feel like Jeff, we've been talking about this book forever, so I'm so excited to be a part of the launch. Uh, really quickly, I just wanted to say thank you to a couple of our partners that made this launch ex extra special. Uh, Joanne Murphy, I think I saw you back there. Thanks, Joanne. Bill Amata, awesome. And Kathleen Share of Gifting. Thank you so much. Here's Michelle. Thank you. So I'm too short for this podium, so <laughs> sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Sugihara, Executive Director of CAPE, the Coalition of Asian Pacifics and Entertainment. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We are the premier nonprofit supporting API success in Hollywood, from the writer's room to the boardroom to your living room. And I have the fantastic job tonight of introducing your wonderful moderator, Jess Vu. Give it up for Jess Vu. So I, I'm going to embarrass her a little before I give the mic over to her. We met about eight years ago as volunteers for CAPE. And she, if you know anything about Jess, you know that she is the walking encyclopedia of API pop culture knowledge, which makes her the perfect person to be the project manager for RISE, and also our communications manager at CAPE. And once I became executive director, I knew that I had to put a ring on it and hire her full time, and she's so amazing. And so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, your moderator for tonight, Jess Vu. Oh man, that was a speech. <laughs> Feeling a little red today. Um, how's everyone doing? Uh, you guys can be louder than that. How are you all doing? Uh, well, thank you for all coming out today, and I hope you enjoy the book. It's just a reminder, there's a bookstore for all those who don't know. You can buy the book. Um, buy two books if you want. Uh, gift it to anyone you, you know. Um, anyway, uh, if you don't know me, my name is Jess Vu. I'm the communications manager at CAPE, the Coalition of Asian Pacifics and Entertainment. Uh, prior to CAPE, I was the project manager of RISE. Um, and I was, I'm so honored to be here to moderate this conversation. Um, you know, we've definitely been through a journey in this, for this book, if you haven't seen our social media. Um, but I am excited to bring these guys on board. Uh, Jeff and the Phils have been um, people who've impacted my own life um, as a young Asian American individual through my teens and through my 20s. And it's been incredible that it's come to this point that you know, I can both call them my colleagues and also my friends. So uh, let's bring them on board. So come on up, guys. Thank you. Hugs, hugs. Oh. <laughs> Hi, yo. Hey, everyone. Hello. This is so unexpected and great and cool. They're like setting up extra chairs. I can't like. This is incredible. For a book. Wow. I, I'm 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 not used to seeing heads not in boxes, so you'll forgive me a little bit. Yeah. How about you guys? Um, for those who may not know, how about you guys just introduce yourself really briefly before we start? Sure. Um, you know, it, it almost feels like we're going to be introducing ourselves like a boy band or something. It's like we've got the cute one, we've got the... No. Elder, elders first. <laughs> oh, yes. The old one. Yeah. But <laughs> he's not wrong. He's not wrong. And actually, uh, for a purpose, right? Uh, the way that we actually organize the book uh, as friends, we come from different spaces and places, even in the evolution of Asian America itself. Uh, over these last three decades, uh, I'm the guy who... <laughs> who in the book reps the 1990s because that was when I came of, you know, sort of full age into this community. Let's hear for the 90s. 90s. Yeah. The Gen Near term nostalgia. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jeff Yang. Uh, I am uh, the custodian of, again, the 1990s and also uh, the guy who kind of trapped these guys into making this thing happen. <laughs> Bill? It's not a joke. It's not, <laughs> not a joke. He trapped us. Uh, my name is Phil Yu. I, um, uh, for a long time now, for 20 years, I've run a 
website called Angry Asian Man, and uh, <laughs> thank you. And uh, I was kind of in charge of like more or less the middle portion of the book, the 2000s. Uh, let's hear for the 2000s, yeah! <laughs> I feel like the 2010s are going to get booed. <laughs> but that's the 2020s, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my name is Philip Wang, uh, and uh, I, I guess I was brought in to talk about the 2010s. Um, but we all worked together on all the decades, really, and, and brought all of our ex expertise and experiences, um, even when I was a teenager in the 90s. Um, but uh, yeah, I uh, am one of the co-founders of Wong Fu Productions. I have the Wong Fu team here Woo! somewhere. Like the, my co-founder Wes is over there too. Yeah, so uh, very, very grateful to be uh, brought into this this project. And I, I, I was I tease about the elder, but honestly, like it's my first foray into the publishing world at all. And to be able to be part of a book like this as your first time, uh, and with this type of support, is honestly truly an honor and a blessing. So thanks, Jeff, for allowing me to to be part of this. <laughs> Respect elders, too. Okay. Kiss the ring. <laughs> for, all, for all you guys to know, I am the youngest one on the stage. So, um, Pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's start in the beginning. So I, I was brought on in October 2020, um, but this book was sold much earlier than that. So, you know, let's start from the, that beginning. Like, how, how did this idea come to fruition, um, and why now? So, uh, interestingly, I mean, as with many of these things, the seed of the book, where it came into being as an idea, is very different from where that seed was ultimately planted and where it grew. Uh, I mean, you know, we had individually been talking with one another, and we were friends. We occupied a lot of the same spaces. You know, here in Los Angeles, if you're an Asian American, kind of like a professional Asian American, <laughs> you you do run into people who are like yourself a lot in places like this one. Uh, so we talked about some needs, the need to remember, the need to preserve and celebrate this big part of history that we've lived through in many cases, but that a lot of other people, people we grew up with, people we gave birth to or raised from birth, <laughs> had no idea about um, and took for granted. And uh, so we had talked about simply writing a history of these three decades that felt to us so incredibly necessary, impactful, and pivotal for our community but that seemed so opaque to a lot of other people. Uh, that was in 2019. Then something happened. <laughs> and uh, when we actually went out to sell this book, we realized we weren't just trying to do a celebration or reclamation. We were in some ways creating a, a, an archive, uh, a, a blueprint of the past and all the ways that we got here, just in case we had to rebuild it all from scratch again because it was at that time in this global pandemic when it, it, it felt so urgent with the world and people all around us living in fear, experiencing hatred uh, and hostility, and in some cases, direct brutal violence. All of the things that we thought we had built, all the places we'd risen to, suddenly seemed very fragile. When I tell you, um Oh, oh, yeah. I, 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 no, we've done this a lot. Well, I think what's, what's, what's uh, kind of funny is that, yeah, like, I think that was going on in Jeff's mind, you know, like, approaching this book. And from my perspective, it was just like, oh, I've had just conversations with them in passing at, like, different events. Um, and, yeah, over the years, I, I, I always knew that they were these um, surveyors and analysts of the culture. And I, I knew that if I had, I, like, I related to that and if I had opinions too or just wanted to like you know talk shop these guys always were were down and we kind of had the similar um, lens of the community and, and where we were going and I think we all remember um, this movie called Crazy Rich Asians um, <laughs> oh, yeah. and this 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 like little little film that could um, and it was such a like you know just a monumental milestone for for all of us and and I was definitely, you know, celebrating what it, what it meant for all of us and the hope that it could give for future projects and the future of, or just um, the trajectory of where we were going. But at the same time, I remember, I'm sure a lot of other professional Asians here in this crowd, you, you, see, you saw the headlines at the same time that were like saying, first movie in 25 years with Asian people. <laughs> and it's, or it's like, first, like, first time since Joy Luck Club has there been a movie like this? And, 
And while, like, you know, technically, yeah, sure, it's true, that there was a part of me that always got, like, a little, like, irked, or, like, not irked in the, like, I just felt, man, it wasn't like we were just sitting around for 25 years not doing anything. There was a lot happening in between that. And it was from people that, like you guys, from people, like, you know, our contributors, I, I knew that we were out there putting in that work. And it made me really kind of sad to think that, oh, we don't get, we don't, like, none of those things got the same type of headlines. Um, and what happens if no one captures it or no one um, wants to document it in a, in a more permanent way? And so this is the thing that I, I would like lament to, to Jeff about, and, and he totally related, because yeah, it was really sad to think about, oh yeah, people are, might forget that about Jin's run on you know, uh, Freestyle Friday. You know? People are gonna, might not even know the film Better Luck Tomorrow when you think of you know, movies that made an impact uh, in the mainstream, right? So these were the things that I was, and as a YouTuber too, I was also like, oh my God, what if people, they, they never really took YouTube for, seriously anyways, and so now we've definitely been like circumvented or whatever. So how do we remember a lot of these nuances and these, a lot of these subcultures and a lot of these movements? And that's why um, I wanted to you know, be a part of this and I'm very glad that I got to contribute those things. How about you, Phil? I, I think similarly, there's always at the heart of this uh, the, the question of like, who gets to tell our stories, right? And for too long and too often, like that's, it's somebody else defining like what being Asian American means or, or what our community is supposed to be. And I think this is just our stab at having some agency and, and like here's the stuff, like what gets to be history? What gets to be canonized as like the most important Asian American stuff? And I think, I don't know, I think we were just trying to collect it all in a place where we're still figuring out what Asian American means. I'm like, and I feel like this book is just kind of a place where we collected all that stuff and we swirl it around and here's our here's our stab at trying to figure that out. And like some of this might be important to you, some of it isn't. But my hope is that people read this and are like they'll they'll read a little bit of it and go, Oh, this is this is a thing. This this happened to me too. I thought it was just me. I thought it was just me and my friends, but like this is the thing that we all oh my gosh, like other Asians, yeah, you know, like I want this to be something that there's a, a level of like recognition in these pages for, for Asian Americans to read this. Now this is like 500 pages, nearly 500 pages of text in color. It wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what Jeff said it, it was supposed to be. They kept adding more and more to it, despite uh, our publisher. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, but it's 30 years of, of history and it's a lot of research as well. So like what has been the surprises that you've like come upon in, in writing and researching. Like I know for me, uh, seeing how many times John M. Chu appeared throughout all our <laughs> interviews, he's like the Kevin Bacon <laughs> of our community. Um, yeah, that was super weird because John we know as the director of Crazy Rich Asians, but he actually pops up in weird little uh, side elements of other people's stories. Like it turned out uh, Suchin Pak, uh, who tells her story, uh, being an MTV icon, but also being inspired by Connie Chung and mistaken for Connie Chung. <laughs> if you were an Asian woman in broadcast back then, you often were. Uh, it turned out that uh, she was, as a, a kid, uh, on this like kids network on a Saturday. It was like you know, a, a local Bay Area affiliate. For, like, yeah. Straight talking teens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And John Chu was on the rival kids show. <laughs> and in fact, took over her spot when she moved on, I think, to, to bigger things. Um, so yes, there's a lot of that. If you actually look at the index, uh, and also if you look at the, uh, if you will, kind of hyperlinks uh, throughout the book, you'll see that there's a lot of interconnections in our community. People show up again and again, people who are connected across projects, people who've actually mentored and made possible other people's work. And that's something we want to really kind of lift up and preserve. I think, though, the this, this most surprising thing for me uh, was, frankly, looking back at the history of, of where we came from uh, as a, a pan-ethnic, pan-Asian community, and recognizing, well, first of all, you know, I was born in 1968. 1968 was the year in which the term Asian American was first used in public as part of these protests that took place in the Bay Area, right? A student, uh, student uprisings, third world revolution moment. Uh, and the reason why Asian Americans created that banner 
was in order to march side by side with black students who were fighting for the release of Huey Newton, Black Panther leader. Uh, so the origination point of our community was first and foremost in solidarity with another community. Uh, it, was a, it was an act of political resistance and you know, an act of common ground. And that has echoed throughout the book. We are a community not just defined by who we are, how we belong to one another, but how we actually collaborate and cooperate with others. And a lot of the pieces in the book were very much about that sort of expansive definition of being Asian American. So I'm, I'm not sure surprising is the right word for me, but maybe revelatory to me, recognizing that we are not a lonely island, the loneliest Americans. I should not have said it. <laughs> We are, we are part of an extended family, and that means a lot. It means a lot to see all of you here as our extended family. I, I was going to, like, you know, you mentioned that it was, like, f almost 500 pages. It wasn't supposed to be that long. And, and just, like, just to tell you guys the process of how we even just, acu like, accumulated the, the, the pieces, it really wasn't that scientific. We, we got on our first meeting after the book was officially, like, all right, you guys got to go write it. <laughs> and, and we're like, oh, shit, we got we to gotta do this now. And we just opened a Google Doc and just started saying, what do we want to see? What should be in here? And the, 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 the list just kept going on and on and on of us just kind of going around and around. Hey, we got to put this in. We got to make sure we do this. We got to make sure we do this. And the reason why it, was, it got to be just more and more and more is because we felt this responsibility, honestly, to, to you guys. Um, that this wasn't just a book about how did Phil grow up, this Phil, and, or this Phil. <laughs> How did Jeff grow up? Like we, we would often have to say, hey, this wasn't my experience, but I know from my friends of friends, this is something that was really important. And this is the, it's this length because it, like, it's our way of showing you guys that we see you. We, we saw what everyone was doing, and it was our best effort to try to capture everything. It, but honestly, it could, be, it could have been longer. It should have been longer. Every article that we went into required hours of, of interviews and you know, pages and pages of transcripts that we had to say, oh man, unfortunately, I'm so sorry. Like, this is gonna be like two pages long. So my, my hope is that when people go, flip to any page, they're gonna find something that, hey, this, this in itself deserves its own book, its own volume, its own mini-series, docu-series, podcast, whatever, because there's so much to like mine from our collective experience. And, and we didn't, we, we did a lot, but there's a lot more too. And, and that's something that we felt kind of Unfortunate, we knew, like, we knew right when we started, oh man, we gotta get ourselves ready on Twitter, there's gonna be people that are gonna be like, um, actually, you forgot this and this and this, and we're like, we know, we know, I'm very sorry. But we tried, that's why it's 500 pages. <laughs> I think also, I mean, collectively, our grasp of Asian American history is pretty shallow. I, mean, I think we can admit, like, we were not taught this history very well in our schools, even amongst ourselves, it's just not, you know, we didn't have the resources to really, that's why, look where we're sitting. It's why this museum exists, right? To make sure that this history is preserved um, and it's told to the next generations. And so, and I feel like our starting point as people who went through the American education system is pretty bad, right? So this was just our stab at like a starting point, right? Um, and like Phil says, like I, Philip says, sorry, that's how we're keeping keep it straight, by the way, <laughs> Phil and Philip. But, you know, each segment, each subject in the book could have its own book length exploration. And, and actually, it would be the greatest compliment if someone read the book and was like, you know, I, I, did, I read this little thing and this little paragraph, I had no idea about this. I kind of did my own research. I did my own research. I, I, <laughs> and and like, I, like, now I'm gonna do, like, I, I don't know, I'm gonna write a paper about it. I'm gonna write a book about it. I'm gonna write, make a documentary about it. Like, that would be awesome. I, I feel like if this book is a starting point for, the, for greater conversations further, deeper, and wider, that would be amazing. Well, let's talk about some of the specific topics that you guys covered. Like, what, are you, what, what was a highlight, or what are you excited for like, people to see? So, um, I will say this, right? Uh, the subtitle of the book is A Pop History of Asian America, and a lot of people automatically assume that means a pop culture history or history of pop culture. And yes, that's a big part of the book, but really pop was supposed to be popular, a popular history, because it's a history of a population. And uh, during these three decades, yes, the way that we were depicted and represented became a framing device 
you know, because so much of our own uh, ability to recognize ourselves came from the fact that we weren't reflected in media. And the not being reflected or being twisted through the media often had really horrific results. You know, we know firsthand that there were people who have been physically harmed, victims of, of violence, tragic uh, hatred that, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit choked up, uh, that has impacted people very close to us, even in this era, but reaching all the way back, you know? Vincent Chin died because he was mistaken for a Japanese person in a time when the media and every single blaring klaxon out there was telling people that he looked like the enemy. That's what we faced over that period. So, yes, the story of, of Asian America is in some ways the story of telling our own story. But the popular piece of it is that we also wanted to represent our lived lives. We wanted to show people what it was like when you actually stepped into our worlds. And so we have these pieces, you'll see some of them around here, uh, that we call spaces. They're like fold out, four page, you know, double decks. For those of you in publishing, you know this is like a very difficult and expensive thing for the, the, the book publisher to have done. But they allowed us to do it because we wanted to have people literally open the book up, step into our world, and see what it looked like. A typical Asian home. In all of our diversity, right, we still have some common spaces, common things amongst us. Uh, Asian grocery stores, boba shops, a night out of K-Town. <laughs> Life during COVID for Asian Americans. We created spaces for each of these, and we annotated them with a tongue-in-cheek, kind of crowdsourced way, asking all of our contributors and friends the kinds of things that they might expect to see in these spaces. And we did this because we wanted to not just, again, preserve them for ourselves, but also because we wanted to invite other people in. Because if you're not Asian and you see these things, you might still recognize yourself. And in doing so, you'll recognize us as human beings. Yeah. Shout out to our publisher and our editor for letting us, letting us put the book together in the way that it, if you, if, it, the book looks amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it weighs a ton, but it, it's also, it looks amazing. And I wanted, we, we wanted it to be like a fun, like we talk about like a lot of serious stuff right now and a lot of doom and gloom, but there's also a lot of joy. And I also wanted it to just be fun when people read it. So my hope actually is that you can flip it up to any page at any time and then start reading and, and, and learn something and be entertained. Um, in terms of like your favorite pieces, uh, there's like, there's so many, just there's really so many. <laughs> I, I, I kind of have forgot, like I've been flipping through and I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot I did that. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about that one. Because it's also been like a year and a half since, since some of these interviews or, or pieces. Um, uh, the one that sticks out to me is, uh, is getting to like have a, just like a short two page spread about the AZN era, um, <laughs> like I, I, for many years, like leading up, leading up to this point, I'm just, I always thought, man, will this ever get depicted in some, you know, medium of some sort? And I think we're starting to like edge into that as the people who lived it are getting into places of positions of power and decision making and, <laughs> and creativity. Like shout out, like turning red, like there's, a, there's hints of that in there too, right? So, um, but yeah, I, I was really, happy that we got to talk about that because that was my high school you know and um, that was that was that era is actually what I feel like empowered me to to be proud like literally it was remember AZN pride with a Y and an E <laughs> and I feel very lucky I, I, I bring this up a lot I actually I recognize that this is a, a very lucky thing I didn't grow up ever feeling like I was lesser because I was Asian even though I grew up in a white area because I had my Asian friends we ate in the cafeteria and the cafeteria was called Chinatown at the time because all the Asians ate there. <laughs> and looking back, that's very problematic. But at the time, <laughs> at the time, we really owned it. If a non-Asian walked into the cafeteria, we'd be like, <laughs> anyways. But that was because of Asian pride. That was the Asian era, and like we we downloaded off Napster, H O T and <laughs> Finkel and J Chow. You know, like we had import tuner magazines. You know, we we wore the clothes. We wore polo sport, aqua de all this stuff. <laughs> And that, that made me, as a high schooler, very proud to be Asian, very proud to be an Asian guy, very proud of the Asian woman. And, and, like, and that led into college where I went to UCSD. I had, was unapologetically having Asian friends, making Wong Fu videos. And so like, I feel like that was a very important area in my life that I'm glad we got to 
feature. That reaction to when he just said AZN and it was like, oh, like, that's why we wrote the book. That's why we wrote the book. <laughs> like, people are just like, you know, if you know, you know, right? And you didn't expect that to show up in a book somewhere, but that's why we did it. But, but you know, that shows a little bit of the tension, the sort of generational tension. <laughs> Because I, I was certainly aware of this thing that was going out there with that AZN. The, the young folk were doing this AZN thing. But, you know, with like the screen names. Anyway, uh, when, when I was in my growing up heyday, coming into adulthood, like, you know, hanging out with friends, we were like listening to, you know, uh, European synth pop, you know? Like, right. Bizarre Love Triangle was the anthem, you know? And that was in the East Coast, the way that we lived our Asian American lives. And so when I, I heard about your experience growing up, I was like, holy, sh holy shit, <laughs> it's just like so different. Right, and, and that's, that's why actually like the three of us, even though it doesn't seem like it's that diverse, it's three heterosexual men, two of which are named Phil, um, <laughs> East Asian men, I should say too. Like we, we still had to convince each other of a lot of things that we weren't fully aware of. Like I, I actually pushed back maybe like two, car two twice on the bizarre love triangle thing. And, and he vehemently insisted, no, Phil, this was the thing. And I, and I tried to get tech, like, technical with him. I'm like, well, technically, that's in the 80s. That's not in our decades yet. And also, we technically, in the 90s. right. And the technically, um, these are like, what, like, you know, British bands. Should we, should we be like, you know, talking about non-Asian? But, but, but they were very adamant about it, which, and I'm glad they were. And, and I think that's the one thing that we all did with each other. Even like when I said, hey, Last minute, like in the 11th hour, I said, hey, we have to do a piece about um, Asians in like the EDM rave scene. We have to do pieces about Asians in esports or in, um, in gaming and streaming because that's like where that's that's like very current right now. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> go, Phil. You know? So so I think like just having the three of us and, and the, the, even the concept that that Jeff kind of constructed of these decades um, was was really, really important. and and created a, the best possible project, product for that. Otherwise, for sure, it, like, things would have felt, fallen through the cracks. And I'm not saying that we covered everything, but like, we, got a, we got a good amount, I would say. Yeah, there's, a good, there's a many, many conversations where it was just like two or three of us convincing the fourth person <laughs> or third, like, no, this is a thing. This is a thing. Yeah. I, I actually had to convince Jeff that like Dante Basco was still relevant with people. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Younger, <laughs> younger no, 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 no. than me. Let's okay? get this right. It was the argument was the argument was actually about uh, his role as Rufio in Hook, which I remembered as something. I was like, holy shit, I grew up with it. Why would people even know about it now, right? But literally, literally, people still shout that shit in his face in the street. Je Jeff just got canceled right there. <laughs> The entire hour-long program. The three of us are like, no, he needs to be on the cover. One and he tweet. needs to be on the cover as Rubio. <laughs> <laughs> um, but go, uh, transitioning into that, um, you know, with these three decades, I, I just want to talk, especially when we're, uh, before we uh, inter um, bring up our, all our contributors and interviewees and, and so on, um, how do these three decades that you all have lived in, like, tie together, and what, what do you see in terms of the our, our future generations? You know, I, I will say this. I feel like uh, having seen through the eyes of, of my kids the very different way in which they look at the world, right? Um, and, and maybe very specifically the older one <laughs> who accidentally found himself at the middle of this pivot uh, for Asian American representation in popular culture himself. Uh, so Hudson Yang, for those of you guys who don't, everybody here knows. <laughs> I'm just the father of Hudson Yang at this point. Uh, but, um, you know, when he was even first getting that role in Fresh Off the Boat, uh, first, you know, being put in this position of, for me, for, for Phil, and for Philip too, you know, carrying the weight of this representation to the point where, uh, where Phil and, and, and Jenny Yang uh, and, and Joanna they coined a term, literally, for how they felt about Fresh Off the Boat uh, and whether it was going to succeed, right? Uh, yes, the term we came up with for when you see Asians on screen and you're like, oh God, please be good. <laughs> That's called the rep sweats. <laughs> so the rep sweats was a thing. It was a thing for all of us. Every single time we saw any Asian doing anything, behaving hopefully well and not badly, you know, we had that sort of sense of like, oh my God, if they are bad, it will destroy every pop possible opportunity for us forever 
it will salt the earth and there will never be another Asian face on screen again, right? That, that was a truism for many, many years. Uh, but for Hudson, he was like, it was chill because he, he did not know a world in which he didn't basically feel comfortable with his Asian skin. And this is not to say that he did not have his own anxieties and issues, but it did feel like there was a difference in the way he looked at the world. Asianness itself was not something that he was concerned with representing. And uh, that wasn't true in the 90s. I will say, the very, very biggest thing that I learned if, if I, you know, in this process of going through these decades is that back in the 90s, there were people for whom the term Asian American felt like a liability to the point where they were like, oh, I'm a writer, but you're an Asian American writer, right? No, no, I'm a writer who happens to be Asian American. <laughs> you know, it, it, I don't want to call myself an Asian American writer because then it would limit me. I could not be universal. I could not speak to people who look different from this, right? But we live in an era now where we know that specificity is universality. And we can live exactly who we are and represent who we are without fear that that's going to alienate other people. That was the goal we wanted to get to. I think, I think like looking into the next like generation of how and how this book might, might affect, it really is, and, and I'm not saying that we're the only book, and there's amazing, uh, so much great content now, but similar, like, you know, just bit, bit like what Phil was saying earlier about like the, the education system and how much of our history is actually taught, and that's like a lot of like the doom and gloom stuff, but there's like a lot of like the fun stuff and the, and the great, and the pop culture stuff that I, I, I'm, I'm hope that this book can at least be a tool or a reference for parents, for um, siblings, whatever, to at least point to something and say, hey, this was, yeah, this was a thing. This is, this is what shaped me because, yeah, you're not going to get that in school. You're not, uh, you're not going to get it that often in, in, in mainstream media, although that's, you know, shifting right now. But, you know, I, I, you know when I was growing up, I, I, why did I know why, who Bob Dylan was or whatever, like my, but, or who the Beatles were? This, because that was the, the, we're living in that culture here, right? And so I hope that this book can pass on the things that were important to previous generations to say, hey, you don't have to be a fan of this yourself, but just know that, that we've, we've been here, we've been doing things, there's been cool stuff, and if you want to be hip too, you can like this stuff too. <laughs> um, that, that's what I hope for, for how people kind of view this book. And, and, Again, it's incomplete, and maybe we already have found many errors in the book already <laughs> before it was even published. So we have to do a reprint, so please buy more books so that we can get that next shipment order. Um, and yeah, perhaps the next time we do this, it's, it's not 30 years fit into one. Maybe only 10 years will fit into one volume, right? Because there is so much more that everyone's contributing. I think uh, our dedication at the beginning of the book sums it up for me. Uh, this book is for those who come next. Um, I mean, why are we doing this? We're doing this for, because it's, we want this to be easier for people who are coming up, who are coming up behind us, right? Like, who, who are going to be the future of Asian America. We want it to be easier. Not that there is going to be challenges or struggles, but, like, we want all this to be... We, we want all this to, be, to sort of... If you know your history, this becomes a lot easier, right? Feeling like we live in some kind of vacuum of Asian American identity uh, where we feel isolated alone. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we just don't know our own stories. So I, I want, for those who come next, for it just to be a little bit easier. That's why we're doing it. This is for my daughter, you know. Uh, so, yeah. Well, with that note, that's a good way to end this portion of the conversation. We want to bring up our contributors. Uh, we have so many people here tonight that have been a part of the book. Um, I'm going to name as many as I can to come up on stage if they want that are here. Jen Wong, Nancy Wong, Yuen, Dino Ray Ramos, Oliver Wong, Paulo Yu, um, and uh, Will Yu is here as well. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, so one of the things we actually want to make very clear is that even though uh, we are the quote-unquote authors of the book, uh, it took more than a village. It took an entire uh, extended community of people who we respect and admire and been inspired by to make this book happen. 
And what that meant was reaching out to all of our friends and our friends' friends, all the people who are heroes for us, uh, to be a part of this book and to bring their own unique voices to it. Um, this is just a tiny selection of, of that larger group, including of the people in this room. And we'll have a couple more waves <laughs> coming up. Sorry about that. Uh, but we wanted to just quickly uh, you know, go through what some of these additional contributions were. Um, and we'll, we'll start with uh, Dino, uh, so. Hi, I'm on page 439. <laughs> <laughs> prepared, prepared. Oh. Open the book. Uh, See all of this. So Dino, just tell us a little bit of what your contribution was. So um, my contribution was kind of my story as a Filipino American living in Texas. Um, come on, Texas. <laughs> all right. I went to a and m whatever um, <laughs> but um, no, and then kind of every time I remember when I would introduce myself to people and or like when I moved to San Francisco back in the day, and they would be all, "Oh, there are Filipinos in Texas, and I was all bitch we everywhere <laughs> you know it's like it's like but also there's this interesting thing is like also I was like one of like three Filipinos in a high school of like a thousand people, and they're all, "Oh, do you know Fred?" He's Filipino, and it's like, well, yeah, we do because we're the only two here. But yeah, and it kind of, uh, I wrote about how you know my dad was in the military and my upbringing of kind of, in a way, me being kind of coming to terms with my Filipinoness or realizing that I was Asian and how, you know, I was treated. It didn't happen until I went to Texas A&M, which at the time was like 88% white. Mm. So that's when I, that's when Dino came out, girl. <laughs> I was just like dyeing my hair every fucking week and wearing <laughs> Jinkos. Come on, Jinkos! So yes, <laughs> Dino was uh, as a contributor to something uh, that was a running feature of the book we call Postcards from Asian America, where we got people to speak about their kind of, in many cases, unexpected stories uh, of coming from places that weren't the big coastal cities that you know we're in right now, for instance. And it, it was amazing to actually hear and see those. Um, I'm gonna bring it over to Jen now, Jen Wang, uh, who is half of one of our favorite uh, 2000s phenomena. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I, hi, I'm Jen Wong. Um, I'm actually a Texan, I was born in Bryan. Okay, Bryan! Uh -huh, <laughs> that's right, because they didn't have a hospital in College, college station, station at the time. So, College Station, Bryan, that's where Texas A&M is. Yeah. yeah, my dad actually landed there in 1965. Uh, well, it only integrated two years earlier, in 1963. So my, my parents came to Texas in the 60s, um, and you know, like it, the civil rights movement had not really landed in small town Texas. So my mom was told to sit at the back of the bus. My dad was, you know, chased off his bike. My dad, one of my dad's roommates uh, was Wen Ho Lee. Um, so, you know, it's funny when he was when he was accused and he was you know in solitary. I remember being so mad about it, and I went home and I was like, "Oh my God, I can't believe what's happening to Wen Ho Lee." And then my mom was like, "I know he's so weird, <laughs> but he's definitely not a spy." <laughs> and then much later, like true to like Asian parent form, I remember she was. I was like, hey, "How's Wen Ho Lee doing?" You know, way after after he was free and. She was like, he's okay. We just talked to him recently, but um, his daughter's not married. So I was wondering, do you have anybody to hook her up with? <laughs> um, All right, so talk about what you did for the book. Okay, you're like, keep it moving. <laughs> oh my God, okay. So we did, we called this, uh, Diana and I, my partner in crime um, for discretion. <laughs> We called this the, the easiest book we didn't have to write because they were like, just talk on a Zoom, just like do what you guys did, like just shit talk and uh, you that know about people. Yeah. That was, yeah, that was really easy. So yeah, that's what we did. And um, so we covered the 90s, the aughts and the teens and that's kind of our age spread too because yeah, I mean, we covered it all. I'm actually Gen X, she's like, Gen, I'm a, a millennial denying post Gen X <laughs> millennial. Millennial. I think so. Millennial. I think so. I'm in the same boat. I think so yeah. too. It's like I identify with the middle fill. So yeah. Describe a little bit of what the middle, the middle, middle fill. Middle fill. Middle fill. <laughs> middle fill. 
Describe Discreation. What discreation is a blog that we started in the early aughts. And 2007. 2007, in the mid aughts. I can't count, I'm, we're also two Asian women that weren't great at math <laughs> uh, and focused on the liberal arts. Come on, Andrew. <laughs> um, but we started writing a blog right about the time when blogs were exploding as the medium to, to sort of discuss representation as representation was exploding all over the internet. And discretion was a word that we made up out of nothing that was before the brilliant term rep sweats, which Jesus Christ, <laughs> wish I had thought of that. Um, and it, it was about this idea of disgrace and how pervasive it is in Asian culture and identity and how you feel the rep sweats because you're so fucking scared that somebody is going to disgrace you when they're <laughs> representing you in pop culture. So we wrote about that um, pretty exclusively and tried to hit the highs and the lows, and we hadn't done it for a while, but we came back and... We brought you the guys, band if back. Guys, if you know, you know, right? <laughs> we reunited Discretion. That's, that's a crowning achievement for our book. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Aww, hi. Paula. Oh. Hi, I'm uh, um, Paula Yu, and, um, and I just want to say we are firmly Gen X. I have <laughs> many in incriminating photos from our Asi AAJA, Asian American Journalist Association days. I've, I've known Jeff for uh, decades. And I did want to say I was actually just in Houston. I flew back. I gave a speech at an anti-Asian racism conference at the Holocaust Museum. And Houston is wonderful, and it was a great museum. So yay, Texas. I just, yeah. But, but anyway, just uh, to go, because we've got a lot of people to talk uh, that are here, I wrote the essay on Vincent Chin, because I have a young adult narrative nonfiction book that came out this year called From a Whisper to a Rallying Cry, The Killing of Vincent Chin, and that's the longest title. <laughs> from a whisper to a rallying cry, the killing of Vincent Chin and the, and the trial that galvanized the Asian American movement. And it's won a lot of awards. It was long listed for this year's National Book Award. And I'm currently, oh, thank you. And I'm currently a finalist for the uh, Los Angeles Times Book Prize. And my essay was about how I, I'm self-taught. We talked earlier about education. I'm self-taught when it comes to Asian American Pacific Islander history. And I just want to say I have 12 books that I've written for children and young adults uh, been published by Norton and HarperCollins and Lee and Lowe Books. And I want to say, in 1975, when I was in the first grade, I told you I'm Gen X, when I was uh, in the first grade, Lawrence Yep's Dragon Wings was a Newbery Honor Medal winner, which is one of the highest prizes you can get in children's literature. Not in my library. I didn't know any about this until I was in my 20s and 30s and even my 40s, and I felt cheated because I felt I had been ripped off, not only my childhood, but my identity. And that's what drives me to write these books today for children and young adults, and especially, you know, that's what I wrote about in this book. But I do want to say very quickly that um, there was a survey that came out saying that one out of four Asian American Pacific Islander children and teenagers have reported being bullied, physically and verbally harassed because of the pandemic. And if Asian American Pacific Islander had been taught this whole time that number could have been zero. And that's why I'm grateful that Illinois and New Jersey are the first two states to implement mandated AAPI history be taught in kindergarten through 12th grade. We gotta get all the states going. Thank you very much for this honor. Hi, I'm Nancy Wang Yun. I wrote, um, in each of the decade, I covered yellow face and brown face, so <laughs> lots of fun. <laughs> but I think it's the first time that um, all of this is compiled together. So, because I think that people think, okay, you know, Asian representation, where were Asians in the beginning? They were actually played by white people, right? This, this is not just yellow face, but also brown face. And when you put it all together, you kind of see just how, how bad it is and, and understand why we have all these stereotypes today because they were actually created by white actors pretending to be us, right? And so, and so it's just, you know, it's a good reference. It's a lot, a lot of yellow face. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm William Yu. Uh, I wrote the chapter on hashtag starring John Cho uh, because I created hashtag starring John Cho. Um, yeah, and I think that for me, I think speaking of yellow face and the legacy of, of misrepresentation for Asian Americans, I feel like starring John Cho was a response and feeling of feeling some sense of urgency and wanting to take some agency in this conversation and being very frustrated that whenever we talk about who that leading person is going to be, who that, who that face is going to be, it always ends in the, 
the hypothetical and the theoretical. And I think to me, I, I kept having this conversation with my friends being like, there's got to be somebody, there's got to be someone that is already tried and true, is already ready for this opportunity. And John is pr a proven talent and someone that I think has all the credentials that combat all the, all the excuses that Hollywood likes to make. And, uh, and wanted to create something visible and tangible. And so my chapter was really fun in getting to examine that and what that means for the future, uh, but also getting to interview John and see what his reaction to all the posters were, because we never got to do that. We've had a lot of conversations, but it was, it was great to see what posters he, he liked and, and didn't like. <laughs> You're fantastic at Photoshop, by the way. I think that's what no, more people need to talk about, actually. Yeah. Hi, I'm Oliver Wong. I wrote the essay on Filipino-American DJs in the book. Um, real quick, I first met John because we were both students in an Asian-American poetry class at Berkeley, so it's been incredible to see his just life and career since then. And, and the hashtag thing, I thought that was amazing, so sh a shout out to you. Um, I'm just gonna get my soapbox real quick, and I love the intro comments that all three of these, these folks made because, I mean, this is a really special book in, insofar as it took until 20, Pardon my friend, well, there are kids here, I'm not gonna swear, but it took until 2022 for a book like this to exist, which is amazing on one hand, but also really sobering to contemplate, like it took us this long to get there. Um, I've been writing about Asian American culture, pop culture, uh, you know, since the 90s. I used to write for Jeff back in the day. Um, as an academic, I've been, I've been researching and studying Asian American pop culture for, for uh, even longer than that. Even in academia, where books don't have the same necessity to be sort of marketable, there's literally three books that exist that have been published in the last, what, 17 years. I mean, it's really thin out there. So one thing I'm just gonna pitch real quick to folks out there, buy extra copies of the book, donate it. I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna donate a copy to my daughter's high school library because I can just imagine when growing up, that book was there when I was growing up, how that might have just sort of changed my direction. Push your local municipal libraries to carry the book. Don't donate it because they'll just go through this. Like, tell them just buy the book, right? But like, get it out there, right? Get it for yourself, but get it out to as many people as you can in a way where, again, I, you know, as, as Phil was saying, like, this is a book for who comes next. That's our kids, the people that we know, their children. And the more that they have exposure to something as rare as this, I think is just a net good. So thank, thanks to everyone here for contributing to it. Thank you. Thank all of you guys. Thank to all of our contributors, both in this room and beyond. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Let's give another round of applause. All right, we'll, we'll call out some of the uh, interviewees we'll have, we had in the book, if they could come up. Uh, Tia Sarkar, uh, Shujata Day, Perry Shen, Tamlin Tomita, uh, Sagar Sheikh, um, uh, Bibian Ngo, Perry Shen. I think that's it. Oh, who? Oh, Sean Big. I hope I pronounced your last name. This is us. So, um, one thing about creating this book is uh, there's there really is no silver lining to a global pandemic. But I will say this: when you got a lot of people who are incredible role models and inspirations who are sitting at home with not a lot to do, <laughs> it's a lot easier to get them on Zoom and talk to them and. Uh, we were really fortunate to be able to put together some incredible just like conversations and round tables and reunions, right? Um, I'm actually gonna turn the mic over to, to Phil to uh, maybe walk through uh, our illustrious panel of uh, interviewees here. Well, one of the things that uh, the book was really about was like trying to, like what are the sort of these moments and tent poles and things like that that really define sort of Asian American pop culture um, and one of the things that I really wanted to do was get the people who were involved with making it to, to speak, you know, and get them all to back together. So um, 
maybe everybody could just go down and introduce yourself and which, um, which panel you were part of, actually. If you remember. <laughs> It was after Asian August, yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure I got the name of it right. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tia Sirkar, and I was part of the after Asian August <laughs> discussion. Um, should I, I, I'll just talk a little bit about yeah, what yeah, we talked yeah. about. It. Okay, yeah, so um, I also grew up in Texas. <laughs> 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 and um, we like to talk about it when we're from Texas, if you can't tell. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I'm, I'm South Asian, I'm Indian, I'm Bengali, and growing up in, did I hear a woo? Woo! <laughs> woo! Oh, I'm sorry! <laughs> um, um, so I grew up in, you know, growing up in Texas in the 90s, being, a, you know, like a film and TV enthusiast, knowing that I wanted to be a performer when I, when I grew up. Um, you know, there was a glaring lack of, of Asian representation, specifically South Asian representation. We talked about this in our conversation. You know, we, we had a poo. That was it. It was a poo from The Simpsons. Not a not great representation. No offense to The Simpsons, but so you know, going from that uh, to now, when we talked about, I mean, it's not just Crazy Rich Asians. You've got like Never Have I Ever and um, every you know the Mindy Project and and Hasan Minhaj and you know, there's just there's there's so definition, much. Definition, please. Definition, please. What am I talking about? <laughs> definition, please. <laughs> like shows like Warrior. I mean, there's just so much. I mean, it, there's been such a tangible shift as an actor in LA and Hollywood from when I got here. And I would, I mean, you, we've probably been doing this about the same amount of time. We audition against each other all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, you know, I, I would go out for uh, uh, Sheila, ethnically ambiguous. And that <laughs> meant maybe us or maybe y'all or maybe, you know what I mean? It, like, but probably but, but eventually ended up being Caucasian, right? Yeah, absolutely. Brunette. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, she might not, yeah, it, it runs the gamut. But, but now, I mean, even in the time that I've been doing this professionally, um, there's been a tangible shift in, in what, uh, what, what is possible for someone who looks like me or someone who looks like you gets to, gets to play and, and what is realistic that, you know, is possible for us. And so it was really thrilling to talk about you know our journeys but also the fact that this book exists and celebrates all of the milestones and and catalogs the people who you know were doing it long before I was ever doing it and who paved the path for those of us that you know you know cleared the path for us to kind of get in there and and it's continuous right so i mean it's, I'm, I'm excited to see the next version of this and then the version after that. And the corrected version. No, no, no. no. The one, the, the, extend, the extended version. <laughs> Thank you, Tia. Hi, I'm Sujata Day, creator, writer, director, star of Definition, please. <laughs> <laughs> now on Netflix, go watch it tonight if you haven't watched it yet. Um, so I was so excited to be um, asked to be on a panel about one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Woo! And, and as, as a person in comedy, uh, when I watched that movie for the first time, I, it changed my life. And, and I was seeing my friends in that movie. And I was seeing me in that movie. And it was so exciting to see... Um, you talked about the rep sweats. And that's interesting because we, we, we kept seeing visions of us on screen that were like the perfect... Uh, the model minority, and um, to to not see that was so exciting to me, <laughs> and and I was like, oh my god, and and that really you know inspired Definition Please. Actually, that film itself, just being out there, and I got to be on a panel with the, uh, Hayden Schlossberg and John Hurwitz and Lee Shorten, and we just talked about you know kind of the model minority myth and putting ourselves on screen, and it was a really exciting panel to be a part of, so thank you guys so much. Thank you. Uh, and Gautam Nagesh and Anna John, who organized it, who are also here. Uh, it, it, what I think Harold and Kumar did was it opened the world up for uh, basically stoner Asians to be represented <laughs> in public. Stoner culture. Asian representation. <laughs> hey guys, I am uh, Saga Sheikh. I'm Sean Baig. I am also from Texas. 
Let's go, Texas. Uh, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. All right. Okay. <laughs> And uh, we were, uh, we did uh, the, the Bollywood section, which I think is page 136 to 140. Something like that. Something, Something like, like 136 that. to 144. Yeah. But yeah. I was like, four pages? Okay. That's pretty good. Let's go. Pretty good. Four pages out of 500? That's, <laughs> that's a W if you Not ask me. Not too sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we did have a podcast called the Bollywood Boys Podcast. Uh, and because of that, people think we're like aficionados on Bollywood, but we're actually just two dummies who love Bollywood. Yeah, we literally would watch the movie and like, we would start it three hours before recording it. And be like, oh, okay, that was good. Um, <laughs> yeah. So Jonathan was a guest. She was a guest, so she was a guest. Great yeah. episode. Uh, if, if ever we have a conversation with someone and we uh, said something wrong, they'd be like, I thought you were a Bollywood boy, come on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'd be like, I, I just have a podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was a lot of fun to, to do. We did it for like three years. Uh, you know, um, it got us a lot of, uh, you know, people listen to it in India, in Pakistan. Still, in yeah. Friggin' Germany. Yeah. We have uh, exactly one fan in Germany. One fan. <laughs> one fan. That still listens. Yeah. They've listened to uh, all 60 episodes. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, thank, I just want to thank you guys for having thank you us so much. In, yeah. the, in, in your project up here. Uh, it's such a wonderfully made uh, book, and uh, I'm excited to run through it. I'm going to sit by the pool and read the whole thing. <laughs> can can <laughs> yeah. I just say that I, I, am, I am not the most well-versed in Bollywood movies at all, Same. but this conversation, <laughs> this conversation was really? like huh. one of the most informative and most entertaining things that we did while making this book, so I really <laughs> appreciate you. it. Yeah, thank it you, really thank great. you so yeah, much. One thing that I kind of noticed was like, or one thing we kind of talked about in the book a little bit is like, uh, Bollywood was really our first exposure to movies or show business in general as kids, you know? And maybe as kids we, try to fight how much we liked it just because it was something our parents liked and it was something we couldn't talk about in school. But only now, you know, that we're comedians and actors in the industry, do I realize like how much of an influence Shah Rukh Khan actually has on me. You know, even just anything I do, any character I do on stage, like, yeah, there's a little bit of Shah Rukh Khan in there for sure. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to Shah Rukh Khan, man. The GOAT. He's, the he's, goat. he's watching This right man now. changed my he's life watching. as a kid. <laughs> Hello, um, whoa, this, my voice normally does not, this sounds, wow, I'm not used to hearing my voice. <laughs> um, my name is Vivian Ngo, um, I'm a Vietnamese American actor and filmmaker. I participated in a really awesome conversation with Diep Tran, who's a Vietnamese American theater critic, on our very complicated relationship with Miss Saigon. Um, I was sitting there um, in the audience just now, and I just had a moment where I just kind of sat back and I was like, 15 years ago, like exactly to the day, I was in one of my final tech rehearsals for the first show I ever did, and it was Saigon. Um, and I was a 16-year-old kid playing a Vietnamese prostitute while a bunch of white kids around me were running around in yellow face. Um, and strangely enough, I hate to admit it, I loved it at the time because it was just, I had never been able to tell a story about my people. Um, but obviously in the last 15 years, my relationship with the show has changed. Um, and I am very happy that I no longer feel pressured to go to like an open call of Miss Saigon because the industry has changed. Um, so yeah, we kind of spoke about that and uh, I was very happy to have that included, yeah. I, I think that Miss Saigon is one of those, and it comes up in multiple pieces. Uh, in, in the book because it was such a pivotal uh, exposure of a basic tension in Asian America. We want to see our stuff made, we want to see our performers get opportunity. We also know that doing so means sometimes you do roles that don't necessarily feel great, right? Like, you know, all those people who played bad guys in many, many movies long before we could be the leading men, the rant heroes, and the like. Uh, and of course, Phil documented the awesome Asian bad guys himself, so. <laughs> um, but with that, uh, let's go to uh, somebody who's famous for also playing kind of a bad guy, but also a romantic hero. <laughs> who's this? Oh. <laughs> Perry Shen. Hey, uh, my name is Perry Shen. Woo! And uh, thank you. Uh, I was, 
this is it was this conversation was a long time ago, <laughs> so <laughs> forgive me. But they got together. I was part of a movie called uh, Better Luck Tomorrow. That Woo! Yeah, Woo! I don't know, awesome. Uh, came out, uh, debuted in Sundance a Film Festival 20 years ago this past January, and um, so yeah, it was it was kind of a Cinderella story. Justin Lin, director, he kind of wrote, uh, co-wrote and directed the film. Uh, took out 250 grand on credit cards, kind of made the movie he wanted, and a lot of people in Hollywood saw the script and said, we love it, but your whole cast is all Asians. We'll give you a million dollars, four times the budget, if you change it to all, you know, you know anyone else but Asian, you know? <laughs> and that's why Justin said, you know, I'm gonna have to do this my way, and he maxed out 10 credit cards, uh, went 250 grand in debt, uh, made it the way he wanted to, uh, cast who he wanted to, and uh, it was all Asian Americans, and it was kind of groundbreaking because even the back back then, you could only have maybe one Asian on a show or a movie. If you had more than one, they had to be like related or like like hi, wait, don't are they really, how do why are there two? You know, and <laughs> and that this was five and very different personalities and kind of proved that you can have that happen. And um, we got purchased by MTV Films, which was owned by Paramount. And when we came out the year after. Uh, we kind of like, this was before social media, it was just through word of mouth, through email threads, everyone came out to support, and we became the number one movie uh, per screen that, that weekend. It was Woo! amazing. Uh, so yeah. Uh, it, it was the manual version of Gold House, Gold Open, yeah, basically. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, it was, it was kind of amazing to see what could be done um, without all these technological advances that we have now. But. Uh, we just had a conversation with the whole cast and got us all back together to relive kind of like how we started, um, all the, the how the, the height of the popularity was, and then kind of like the after effects, kind of like what happened, what what didn't happen that we thought would happen, uh, based on comparing to say watching say like Vince Vaughn when he was in this little indie called Swingers, and then like all of a sudden he's in Jurassic Park two, and we're like, where's our Jurassic Park two? You know? <laughs> it's like no, it doesn't work that way for you guys. Out. Well, uh, honestly, uh, the, the future is bright, and we are so glad that you guys have all been a part of this, uh, even as the world seems to be changing around us. Uh, we, we have one more set of people to bring up. Uh, we thank you guys so much for being, being here on this. Um, I don't think we have a lot of time to talk, unfortunately. <laughs> so, it's a small group. Okay, let's bring up our illustrators and our... Uh, Yes, our uh, audiobook readers are here too. Uh, Linda Chung, Xin Ying Kor, uh, apologies if I mispronounce it, Taiyin Kim, and uh, Rama Valuri. Taiyin. Taiyin Kim, sorry. As we're transitioning, I gotta say, like, even as one of the authors, and this is just a testament to just how deep and how beautiful our non monolithic community is, like, I learned so much along the way, and I'm, I'm the one that's supposed to be part of the you know, we're, we're co-authoring and everything. And, and all of those interviews, I got to like, especially the Bollywood brothers, like, or I was just like, whoa, this is, lear I'm learning so much. And that was like su super exciting for me, yeah. So we'll have you introduce yourself and uh, let us, let the audience know what you worked on. Okay. Hi, my name is Linda Chung. Um, I'm a visual development artist. Um, I'm gonna plug in right now. I'm also a background supervisor on the show Solar Opposites. Stream on Hulu, go like and subscribe. <laughs> um, and I did some illustrations. Um, I did the um, Hong Kong cinema, Bollywood, an article about the anime, um, animation for children in Mulan, and I also did the yearbook spreads. And I would say I thank you so much for roving into our project. It was also a super fun just to like draw a bunch of these like celebrities, but also learning about them. It was also educational for me. It was like a blast from the past. So I was like, oh, Hong Kong cinema. I remember like watching it with my family. And then so I was like, okay, I haven't seen this one before. I haven't seen this. I gotta go watch it later tonight. And um, also, <laughs> I never grew up with cable. So the Hey Arnold episode with like the Vietnamese, like Mr. Huynh story, I was like, oh, I, let's check that out. Just tears. like. Just, I was working in the morning. I was like, oh my god, what is it? And then I sent it to my family, like, hey, watch this. <laughs> so that was great. So yeah, um, thank you again for having me on this project. Hi, I'm uh, Shingyan Kaur. I'm a graphic novelist. My graphic novel, The Legend of Andy Poe, just came out. It is about a 12-year-old camp cook that tells 
Paul Bunyan stories, but reinvented as an old Chinese auntie. Um, and for this book, I illustrated the spread, Stuff Asians Like, um, that, Jeff, that Jeff wrote. Um, and it was really this wonderful. This is Jeff's favorite piece in the whole book, by the way. Coincidentally, it's also my favorite piece. Um, <laughs> and it's my favorite piece because I feel like we talk a lot about like, other people taking our stuff um, and how we should be the people to take our stuff. <laughs> but I actually feel like we should be a little bit more expansionist about it and take white people's stuff. <laughs> um, and that's what that piece is about. It, it, the, the, uh, if you guys haven't seen it, it's around here in one of those spreads. It's basically this crowdsourced thing. All the things that aren't Asian that we somehow made Asian, right? From Costco all the way through to like crab legs, golf, you know, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just really sun hilarious. Sun visors. Yeah, sun visors, exactly. Hi, I'm Tayan Kim. I'm an um, illustrator, artist. I work mostly in entertainment doing storyboards for TV and film. I did the Suchin Pak uh, piece, which I, I still love. I'm also a Gen Xer. Um, and also, Rufio is so relevant. <laughs> you know, there's a song called Rufio by Ukash Ambuktar featuring Dante and, and uh, Lin Manuel Miranda. And do you know who did the music video of that? I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not expecting that mic drop right there. <laughs> you guys, let's go home. Um, I, yeah, I love this piece. Um, I also, you know, I, I'm a little bit sorry to say I don't have, I, di I don't have, I have zero any weirdness about being Asian. I think I just grew up in like the weirdest. I know I'm the only person who's like this, though. Weirdest times and places. I grew up in Westminster in the 80s, <laughs> when it's it was it you know like 100% Asian people, mostly Vietnamese people, um, and and you know in the 90s in Garden Grove, if anybody knows where that is, it, you know it. it so I have I, I grew up with pop all Asian pop culture, and you know I, I had I have zero. It's weird. I'm just in that weird. Anyway, but I think I do have a weird thing. I did have a weird thing about like drawing Asian people or being on an Asian project. It's very underneath. Um, so this was in a way, uh, I don't know, therapeutic? therapeutic? Yeah. Also, there's a beautiful, um, it's not a piece, it's a, a post by Shiyun Kim, who uh, did Big Hero 6. Uh, he's a character designer. And there's a lot of talk about Asian character designs and how Asians have been portrayed in animated film and, and just illustrated things. And I, I don't know, I really loved designing um, Asian faces that look like what I think Asian faces look like. So I'm very honored, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I got one over here. Uh, I'm Rama Valuri. I'm an actor and comedian and voiceover artist, and I got to read the audiobook version of Rise. There are about six of us who read it, including these three lovely gentlemen here. So if you have friends who say they have trouble reading or focusing on books, or books are too heavy, the good <laughs> news is it's available in 20 glorious hours, narrated oh by God. many people, and it comes off as a conversation with all of your friends, which is really nice and really refreshing. And I w was very fortunate I was asked to read it, and when I was sitting in the booth, I had to pause and just appreciate how cool it all was because it was the most comfortable I've been reading a book, and it was a celebration of everything beautiful you see in this room. I got to take a picture just now of everything we see from up here, and it is glorious, and it is beautiful, and this book celebrates all these things about us, about our culture, as a united Asian unit that we may have not been able to celebrate earlier, or didn't even know about ourselves. So it was an honor and a pleasure for me to just get to sit there and read through it. And I was a fan of Wang Fu when I was in college. It was oh. 2005, everybody was sending every video you guys dropped the moment <laughs> it went out Damn. around. And Damn. I've been following your blog for years before I met you. And you and I might have been neighbors in Culver City. So we'll, <laughs> we get to talk about that later. But really, get the book, donate the book to people and Shout out to Sean Baig and Saka Sheikh, who I've been friends with for years. I got to read both of their parts in the Bollywood Boys what? podcast section. And I was also on the Bollywood Boys podcast. We talked about the movie PK with Amir Khan, so one of the other Khans. 
So it's just, it's great being up here. It's cool seeing like TSR Car. We literally just finished watching the after party today before we got here. Uh, Sujata, I've known for a long time, and congratulations, The Definition Please available on Netflix. Go and watch that now. <laughs> Tell all your friends to watch it. And it's crazy, I went from being the one Indian guy at the Second City on the stage out here, fighting for stage time, to the only way I got to perform on the main stage at UCB was because Sean and Sagar and the beautiful folks in the Get Brown asked me to fill in for our buddy Skander while he was writing on Murphy Brown. So now it's not unusual that there was an all South Asian team at the UCB or that you see brown and Asian faces taking up more than one slot at the Second City or IO or the Groundlings or wherever you are. So really, I was so thrilled that this book existed because it was the book I wish existed when I was growing up. So to even be a little part of it, reading it is amazing. And I can tell you, I'll listen to it in the car. It plays great in the car. It plays great in the headphones. And it plays great walking down the street. So, hey you guys. I want him to keep Woo! talking. What a, what a pleasant voice. Yes. <laughs> you could have that voice in your head for 20 hours. Well, this is all the time we've had for this conversation. I hope you all enjoyed it. Woo! it is Thank you. It is not over. You can still buy books. You can still buy one, two, five, ten books if you want. Um, there will be a signing uh, at the table to the right. So if you would like to get your book signed by these three gentlemen or any and of the all contributors. all of our contributors. We'd love you guys to join us there too. Yes. Um, please get in a single file line um, and uh, enjoy your night. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much. <laughs> can Thank everyone join me in a huge round of applause? for Jess, <laughs> and also for Jeff and Phil and Philip. Huge round of applause. Um, I do have to let you all know